So Okay, let's start. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to 2018 Elite Engineers webinar. My name is Raphael, a uh, software consultant from Midas and currently in charge of the webinar. So today's theme is modeling, analysis, and design of still double composite top gutter bridges for SPMT. Uh, the purpose of this webinar is to deliver the insights to engineers so that we can improve the overall uh, performance of the bridge industry. Also, what we need to focus here is how Midas Civil can benefit and how uh, Marco manages this project in terms of modeling, element analysis, and construction sequences for the still and complex bridge project. So uh, for the en engineers who actually want to try this, I prepared the trial materials that you can actually try using 30 days free trial. So please contact me after the webinar. Uh, I will mention about this later. So uh, now let me introduce our speaker first. Then I will explain to you how to ask questions during the presentation. So Marco was currently structures, rail, and construction management uh, group leader at Jacobs in Chicago. He manages all the structures for Jacobs in Chicago, headed both bachelor's and master's degree at the University of Iowa, headed civil engineering for the bachelor's and structure and materials for the master's. Uh, for the more detailed information about Marco, I will leave it to him and let me explain how audiences can ask the questions. So uh, to ask question, like you can see here on the left side, uh, there is a question tab on the control panel. So first, please open the question tab and please write your question down here in this empty space. And third, uh, please send the question the other way to send me a question is you can simply use the chat function. Uh, when you see the picture on the right side, uh, you will see this uh, when you open the chat function tab. So please select send question to Steph. Then your question uh, will be shared with Marco and me, or you can uh, simply uh, chat your question. So I will gather all the question and share with Marco so that uh, Marco can answer the questions after the presentation. So now I'll pass the authority to Marco. Hope you guys enjoy. And if you have any problem, please use chatting function. So I will stand by here. So please welcome Marco. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Marco Loredo. First of all, I would like to thank for the opportunity to, to present. Uh, thank you, Rafael. Uh, just a brief introduction about myself. I think uh, Rafael did a, an excellent introduction. Uh, just to compliment, um, I'm uh, here based in Chicago for Jacobs, and uh, I primarily work on uh, large design build projects, and our group here currently works on the California High Speed Rail and uh, Westgate uh, Tunnel in uh, Australia, Melbourne currently. And the project that I'll be presenting today, uh, this was in uh, Adelaide, um, Australia. And um, um, primarily my experience has been with uh, uh, design build uh, projects. So I'll start my presentation um, with a, a brief, um, hold on, I have some technical problem here. Okay. Uh, okay, so I'll start with a brief agenda. Uh, I'll be talking about the project location, over, overall background, and uh, the design concept. And most importantly, we'll talk about the structural analysis and how we achieve or how we perform the structural analysis, as well as the structural design or the composite girders, and how we went about to uh, model 
uh, the SPMT uh, move. So let me give you a brief intro introduction on the project location. Uh, this project is, was in Adelaide. Uh, Adelaide is located in central South Australia. Uh, it's the fifth most populated uh, city in, in Australia. So as part of this project uh, is the north-south corridor. So what you see here on the screen, uh, this north-south corridor extends all the way from north to south uh, through Adelaide uh, main district, uh, the central business district, and it's about 78 kilometers long. So several years ago, um, uh, the government of South Australia uh, decided to improve the entire corridor, mainly because there are several bottlenecks across this corridor. So to date, out of the 78 kilometers, there's about 44 kilometers of the north-south corridor um, that have been completed, and it's pretty much to alleviate the at-grade crossings between local roads and main, main expressways. So what you see here on the screen, on this little orange segment, and that's the Darlington Upgrade Project, that's where we're currently working. Uh, this section is only 3.3 kilometers. Uh, total construction cost for this segment is about uh, $620 million. Uh, Jacobs is on the design venture. Uh, as part uh, of this project, we are the engineer uh, of record. Uh, here, what you see, these are the project limits and uh, the main limits of uh, the overall project. But I, I just want to point out to uh, some of the main roads and expressways. Uh, in green here, what you have is the southern uh, expressway that meets with the south main road in blue. So this green and blue intersection, it carries, it has major traffic congestion, uh, carries a traffic vehicle, more than 75,000 vehicles per day. So this is a major bottleneck because it's an at-grade crossing. I will show you a, a closer detail to that. But here at this particular location, that's where the two of the SPMT move uh, occurred. That's uh, primarily to install uh, the bridge without interruption to, to traffic at this busy intersection. The other point I would like to point out to you is Sturt Road, which is the, it is here in red, uh, crossing Main South Road. This also is a major bottleneck on this project. Uh, there's about uh, greater than 90,000 uh, vehicles per day on this intersection, creating major bottlenecks as well. And there's uh, three important uh, uh, things that we need to note here is in this um, yellow square, that is a Flinders University, a uh, major university in Adelaide. Uh, and in red uh, square here, we have uh, Flinders uh, Hospital, uh, at, which is the largest hospital in Adelaide. And up in blue, you have a, a commercial and industrial complex along this corridor. Uh, so there, uh, throughout the corridor, there's major bottlenecks and uh, the main objective of this project is actually to take Main South Road and depress it and make it a non-stop um, corridor. I found the, this interesting because I was checking on uh, Google Earth and lo and behold, this was actually taken last year um, when they were building uh, the, the bridge off-site. But here you see up uh, on the upper right corner of the screen, you have Southern Expressway and the main south road that cross, and that's where the major bottleneck occurs. So on the south, which is what you see here is the bridge. This is bridge number two. This was the first bridge uh, moved into, into place, into this intersection here uh, for the Southern Expressway and main south road. And right next to bridge number two, you can actually see the steel segments being erected uh, for bridge number three. So between the spot where the bridge was actually built to the intersection, it's approximately uh, one mile. Uh, closer sc screenshot to Southern Expressway and Main South Road. So that's where actually two of the bridges um, uh, were installed. Uh, the first bridge was installed last year uh, around November 24 and 25th uh, during U.S. Thanksgiving. Uh, and then the second one was actually installed uh, last weekend. So bridge number two, the one I'm be talking about here today, uh, was installed first, uh, and then uh, just last weekend, bridge number three uh, was installed. But uh, what I want to point out here is that Southern Expressway, as you can see, is a at-grade crossing. You have seven lanes at Southern Expressway, and you have about eight lanes at this point 
with the main south road. So this, create, this creates a major uh, bottleneck condition. Um, I did mention about uh, Flinders University and the Flinders Hospital. So you see here Flinders Drive is just a little access road uh, and then uh, it, uh, creating this at grade intersection with same main road, um, which uh, again creates a bottleneck and creates difficulties for uh, emergency vehicles accessing the hospital as well as uh, students going to the university. Going farther uh, north, uh, we have Sturt Road and Main South Road. This is another major bottleneck, and here the situation actually gets worse because um, Sturt Road is uh, nine lanes, and then uh, Main South Road turns into 11 lanes. So, like I said before, the overall objective uh, of the project is to get Main South Road and actually depress it so uh, we eliminate the upgrade crossings and all the structures now are elevated over uh, main south road now as part of the project as far as bridges uh, there's a total of eight bridges being constructed uh, across this corridor to improve the uh, connectivity and the traffic flow um, in the area uh, i would uh, like to point out to the um, uh, uh, the this, so this is where we erected um, these two bridges that uh, I just mentioned, but there is another one, which is the Alex um, Bridge, that is going to be erected uh, further uh, north, which is here on the right corner of the screen. So this one is going into place in the next uh, two weeks. Uh, uh, so in total, there's going to be uh, three SPMT moves as part uh, of this project. So here you can see it is the final design concept, which now is 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 a reality. It's not a concept anymore. Um, where my cursor is pointing here, that this is actually uh, bridge number two. So bridge number two had to be installed first, and then last weekend we installed bridge number three, which is adjacent to it. Um, obviously, the reason that we had to do bridge number two first is um, so uh, bridge number two would come first, and then bridge number three. Um, uh, would come uh, a second. So bridge number uh, two uh, will take uh, Main South Road and actually uh, divert that to local traffic and then bridge number three will actually take vehicles down the main expressway. So eliminating all at grade uh, conflicts. Uh, this is the overall layout of uh, the, the bridge. Uh, this is bridge number two, the first one. This was erected, like I said, last year. Uh, the overall bridge layout was about uh, 600 feet uh, long, total span. Um, at the abutments, um, the girder depth was about 6.9 feet. And then uh, with uh, haunch girders, um, that haunch up to uh, 12 and a half feet at the piers. There was a minor curvature uh, to the bridge, which was about uh, 2,500 uh, feet radius. And the deck width was about uh, 33 feet wide. Uh, that had to accommodate uh, two conditions, one for the temporary condition with two traffic lanes, and then the final condition with uh, one lane of traffic and then a pedestrian path. So what you see here is the uh, cross-section of uh, of the bridge. Um, one thing that uh, I would like to, to point out is uh, this is so this is the temporary condition which we carry two lanes uh, under the, the, this condition. So the girders were with uh, uh, we use vertical uh, web girders and um, uh, precast panels. I'll show you more about the precast panels. So we have uh, precast panels and with a mix of casting place uh, concrete deck. Here's the final condition, and this is actually a cross section that it was taking uh, actually at the pier over the negative moment zone. And what you see at the bottom uh, here, this is the uh, double composite um, action that it's created by actually putting a concrete slab at, at the bottom uh, on the bottom flange uh, at the piers. Um, we apply some shear studs into that zone, so you create that uh, composite action um, along the uh, negative moment uh, zone. Now, as far as the 
the deck panels, uh, the contractor decided to use a uh, precast deck panel. And what you see here is actually the panel that was used. The panel in itself, and in Australia they call this uh, trans floor uh, slabs. Uh, the panel in itself is only five inches uh, thick and um, accommodates uh, uh, pockets for, for the shear studs. And then after the precast panels are placed, there is an a, additional five inches of additional casting place concrete uh, that is placed. So total overall thickness of the deck is about uh, uh, 10 inches. And then the shear uh, pockets, uh, they were, uh, overall they were spaced every uh, 12 inches. So what you see here is um, the transfer panel. Uh, this is not the actual bridge, but this is just the concept um, that is used in Australia. Uh, transfer panel, they're primarily truss panels where you have these bars uh, coming out of the slab and then you have the transverse bars that are actually welded, uh, so creating this truss action. Um, and then here on the right, you have a different example of the uh, transfer panels being used, but the difference here is that you actually have uh, the barriers being monolith monolithically, uh, monolithically uh, with the precast uh, deck panel primarily just to expedite construction. Um, we use a similar situation here for this bridge, but uh, I'll explain later, but they were, we were not able to uh, use the uh, cast, the full barrier primarily because our overhang was uh, uh, fairly long and create some uh, undesirable bending stresses uh, on the slab. So now let's talk about the structure analysis. As part of this project, we uh, use MIDA Civil um, for the bridge analysis. So uh, there were some required models that we had to create. Um, we create models, obviously, to analyze the uh, live load uh, condition. Uh, the temporary live load with two lanes control the design, but we also analyze for the fi final live load condition with the pedestrian path. And within the same model, uh, we perform the analysis for the SPM and move. And in addition to our global models, we develop some uh, local analysis uh, models um, to perform some finite element. And this was all done with uh, um, MIDAS Civil and a combination of uh, also MIDAS FEA. What you see here is the uh, full 3D uh, model that uh, it was created. Um, deck where we use plate elements as well as for the tubs and all the internal stiffeners, transverse stiffeners included, we use uh, plate elements and then all the internal uh, cross bracing, uh, what we use was just uh, beam elements. Now the goal of the 3D model was not necessarily to uh, do the full design of the bridge, uh, even though we did a verification but the goal of the, um, the 3D model was primarily to analyze um, the uh, interaction um, of the supports caused by the SPMT. And this is what you see here uh, on the screen where we have the stress plots. But if you notice on the right here where we have um, these arrows pointing up, that's actually the placement of the SPMT supports um, so we were able to determine what would be the local effects of uh, the SPMT supports on, uh, on, on the girder itself. Um, so I would like to, before I go to the next slide, I would actually like to show you uh, the MIDAS model. And this is just one of them. Uh, we have different ones because for different purposes. Um, what do you see here, um, the deck of this uh, model, it, those are plate elements, and this is the global model. Uh, we use plate elements for the deck, uh, and then for the girders itself, we use uh, beam elements. Um, what you see here, I'm just going to show you quickly, but this is the, we had to use the erection sequence because the bridge was um, uh, constructed on temporary supports and then uh, with the precast deck panels and then the concrete was for thus creating the composite condition and then the SPMT came into play and then pick up the bridge and took it to its final position. But what you can see here, we did use 
um, the erection module uh, within Midas, which is actually fairly simple uh, to, to use. Um, and in the same model, we perform the erection analysis at the same time uh, we perform a creep and shrinkage uh, for the concrete elements that is uh, given here by this time-dependent material functions, uh, as well as applying all the static load cases uh, within the same model. The good thing, or I think it's a great thing, uh, the great thing about, uh, you know, using MIDAS is that um, the loading uh, functions uh, because it does provide all the vehicles and so you know working in the US and uh, having to define all the Australian vehicles uh, will be a very tedious process but uh, within Midas you actually can get Australian loads uh, and just uh, just with a click of a button uh, you can get your M1600 and your S1600 so here what you have is um, all the loads that are already defined within Midas. And then uh, since we work, uh, do a lot of projects uh, overseas, uh, there are some other countries and live load vehicles that are very helpful so we don't have to uh, uh, define them. So this is in a nutshell, uh, the global model. Um, now, this is the overall uh, beam design uh, layout. Um, so what you see here is just one section, and this section is over uh, one of the piers. Uh, the gray section that you see here is actually the double composite where we place the concrete on the bottom slab. And the reason for that, obviously, is that uh, with a bottom slab at the bottom, we're going to be uh, more effective in taking that, uh, that compression. Um, one of the main challenges that we had as part of this project was the thickness of the web. So one of the goals of the contractor was to minimize the use of steel uh, on the entire project. So um, we had to use a web thickness of uh, 16 millimeters, uh, and that's a, about five, five eighths of an inch uh, for the entire uh, tub girder, uh, which is very challenging when you start uh, trying to design that uh, for the deeper sections because your D over T uh, D being the depth of the slab, uh, depth, depth of the box by the thickness of the, the web, the ratio goes up uh, as close as, as much as uh, 240. So as a result, uh, we had to use uh, longitudinal uh, stiffeners, and this is what you see here on this elevation view uh, with the uh, longitudinal uh, stiffeners. Uh, so the way that this bridge was being erected, uh, so they would bring one segment put over temporary supports, and this is what you see here. Um, and after the bridge was, so they would go ahead and put the additional uh, segments. And uh, after the bridge was complete, the SPMT uh, would come in between the temporary supports. So they had to squeeze in between the temporary supports and then pick up the bridge and take to, um, to its final uh, location. I will show you uh, an overall, there's a, a video I'll show you how the bridge was fully erected, but this gives you an idea. So every time that a, a segment of steel was, was brought up to the field and placed in temporary supports, that was all captured uh, within uh, uh, our MIDAS model. And then as the deck uh, was cast uh, as well, so we could capture the uh, locked-in stresses uh, on the structure. So what you see here is the concept of uh, a double composite. Um, again, it's primarily using the negative uh, bending regions. Um, what they say in Australia a lot is in the hogging zones. Not very uh, common here in the U.S. We just call it negative bending, but this is something that uh, I picked up uh, fairly quick when I was in Australia. So it, this go, goes over the hogging zones, and primarily it's because your compression is at the bottom slab. Uh, this con concept is not common in the U.S. Uh, it has been... Uh, mostly used uh, in, in Europe and uh, currently is being adopted in, in Australia uh, by a lot of the contractors. And as a matter of fact, on this project, we have several bridges that are, uh, are using uh, the double composite uh, concept. Now, even though that this concept is not fairly common in the US, there's a very good research um, 
paper, a study done by the University of South Florida. And that was done in about uh, 2010. Uh, we did get a hold of this um, uh, study report. Um, I think if you go to the website and Google it, you might be able to download it for free. Um, but um, we use this study as a basis for, for our design. And uh, one of the issues, and if you go over the study, uh, there's a couple of issues that you have to address when designing for uh, double composite. Uh, the first one is that, you know, there's always that urge to make your, your steel, the steel bottom flange as thin as possible. Um, but there's a penalty that you pay for that because if you make your steel bottom flange uh, fairly thin, then what's going to happen is that what they found that there would be debonding between your steel plate and, the, and your concrete slab at the bottom, thus creating local buckling. Um, so we had to address this issue in our design by being careful and not to make the web too thin uh, and to be a little bit conservative as far as our design went. Uh, and the other issue that you have to address is that when you're pouring the slab on the bottom, uh, on the bottom flange plate, if you have a wide box and you're, you have a wide uh, bottom flange with a fairly thin plate, because you're not under the composite state, uh, the tendency is that the bottom flange is going to bulge out. And when the concrete hardens, you might end up with a bulge and harden a bottom flange. Uh, so this is another thing that we use our uh, 3D finite element model uh, to assess the weight of the concrete and how much bulging we were going to get. Uh, in order to compensate for the bulging, uh, we increased the thickness just a little bit, but also we provided a transverse stiffness uh, along uh, the, the bottom flange. And keep in mind that the girder is haunched, so by having the, actually the transverse stiffness, it helps uh, pouring the concrete, so your concrete is not going to stay all the way to the bottom of uh, the haunched girder. So as I mentioned before, um, we uh, use uh, shear studs and the slab that we end up with uh, when our design was done was about 250 millimeter slab, which is about a 10 inch slab on the on the bottom flange. So what you see here is the SPMT um, that was used. The bridge move was done by by Sarens. Um, so the we had. Uh, several uh, SPMT located along the bridge for the pickup. As you can see on each pier, we had uh, two supports, one on each side of the pier, and then one on each uh, abutment. And uh, obviously they had to squeeze in, squeeze in uh, these SPMTs uh, in between the temporary supports. So there was the first, uh, the first challenge, challenge. And uh, this is how we had to approach the whole move. Um, on the left, what you see here is the, the first turn. So they're going to bring, they brought the bridge parallel to its final configuration. And then they had to swing uh, the bridge uh, starting on the south end first. And this was done because they had to pass the, clear the substructure of bridge number three, which was the bridge that is going to be, it was placed uh, last weekend. So they would swing the, the, bridge number two uh, south end first and then they would maneuver uh, the north end uh, by rotating into position and then squeeze, squeezing in. Um, this bridge move uh, took about, uh, we had a, a window, a time window of uh, 54 hours starting on a, a Friday night and then we had to have it open uh, by uh, uh, Monday morning around uh, three or four in the morning, I, I don't recall it, but the reason being is that uh, it could not impact a Southern Expressway and that intersection with uh, the North uh, South Main Road, primarily because there were 75,000 vehicles. So it, it was we were under a tight deadline, but era, hope, you know everything went well. Um, the bridge move actually was done in less than uh, uh, 23 hours. Uh, the, the easy part was actually taking the bridge down the road. Uh, and the uh, most complicated was actually to swing the bridge into position. So here I have uh, uh, a video of the, the bridge construction. Uh, this is on YouTube if you want to take a look. Um, I know that you don't have the, the, the sound, uh, 
Um, and I'm going to mute. Okay, so what you, we're seeing here is the location of uh, the bridge uh, on the Darlington. Uh, as I mentioned, is the main South Road bridge. Uh, this was uh, the first one that was installed last year. So this is the erection yard. So they would first install the temporary support piers. And each uh, piece of steel was then placed and spliced. Um, and then we had the precast transport panels. Uh, and then we did for the slab. They're showing that the bike path was poured, but it was not. Uh, this is incorrect. So we actually pour just the, the slab. Then the SPMT supports uh, would come in, uh, pick up the bridge, and then swing out uh, to uh, Main South Road. Um, and from this point on, it was fairly simple. Now what you see here in green, that's a three meter exclusion lane, and that was to maintain access to the hospital, Flinders Hospital, for ambulances. Um, now, what is interesting here is that the bridge is actually crossing another bridge, as you see here by the river. And this small bridge had to actually be, we had to reinforce uh, the bridge uh, due to the heavy weight of bridge number two. So, and here was the most challenging part, which is to uh, bring the bridge in place. And you can see actually the substructure uh, to the left there is the final substructure for bridge number two, but we had to clear by swinging the south end, clear uh, the piers of bridge number three, and then um, finally putting the bridge into place. So that was the schematics, and then we just install uh, the wearing surface, and this is the final concept uh, that you see over here. But this shows the completed bridge number two and bridge number three. So, going back to notes, going back to the presentation. Uh, sorry. Uh, okay. I don't want to show this again. Uh, sorry. Uh, so technical problems here. Okay, there you go. All right, so the way that we approach SPMT analysis, so again, this was all done in uh, with uh, Midas Civil. Uh, so when you're doing an SPMT move, uh, there's different scenarios that you have to investigate. So let me start with the vertical settlement at any SPMT support. So imagine that you're at the SPMT support location and that support actually settles during the, the bridge move or when, when you're trying to put the bridge in place. So by having that support displacement, you have to account for that for in your model so you can see what the displacing, displacements are gonna be on the overall structure as well as the stresses that are generated not only on the steel elements but also on your deck. Uh, when you're dealing with a steel composite structure like this one, um, you see that when you're doing SPMT moves, the main concern is actually with the deck because by, by being a fairly actually uh, flexible structure, uh, there's a potential for the deck to, to crack. Uh, as a matter of fact, what they do, um, they, will do a grid, uh, they will do a deck inspection so uh, the joint venture uh, along with the client and their reps would do a deck inspection prior to the move to uh, map uh, any cracks uh, along the structure. And then they would have to do another deck inspection after the move to ensure that uh, there, were, there was no excessive uh, cracking. So we also had to look for transverse differential displacements between supports. So let's say you were looking at, you know, at just one support location, and then you have one support on, on the right that settles more than the support on the left, uh, thus creating this differential transverse displacement at the support location. So you have to analyze for that case as well. And then the third case, and if, if you're familiar with SPMT moves, you see that is the twist case, and that's actually the one that tends to control the majority of the time. Is this is this actually the settlement uh, between across two supports? So let's say you have one support at the abutment and one support at the pier, 
and then you have your support at the uh, button and actually going up and down and then ending up uh, twisting uh, the deck. In the majority of the time, that's what it's going to govern, especially uh, on, uh, on, the, on the deck. So here's uh, the, the analysis that we did uh, using Midas Civil. So again, all the uh, deck that you see here, those are plate elements. And uh, when we ran the analysis, we had to come with several different settlement cases. Um, on a simple span, that's fairly simple. You're not going to end up with a lot of cases to analyze. But in this situation that we have here where we had actually eight points of support, um, actually six, right? Six points of support and uh, one on each side. Uh, we had several uh, cases of uh, settlement and twist. We had approximately 150 cases that we had to, um, to analyze. So what you see here is actually settlement taking place at one of the abutments up and down. Uh, and then another example here where you have um, your peer uh, SPMT at the peers uh, settling down. So, and then other cases would be where the adjacent peer would settle and then we would get all the deck stresses and then you would have the opposite abutment settle. Um, and here, this is what I was talking about, the twist. And you can see how stresses uh, rise fairly quick when you have a twist case. So you see what you have here is abutment, uh, uh, what we call abutment B for this project. Uh, one side of the abutment going up and the other coming down, thus creating a twist uh, on the deck. Now, by using this type of analysis, um, we were able to pinpoint what would be the, the key points where stress would rise fairly quick and where we had to control the displacements. So by doing this analysis, we were able to uh, determine what would be the allowable limits because that's one of the things that we had to give to the contractor. Uh, contractor wanted to know how much my SPMT support can go up and down and how much I'm allowed to twist and where I had to put my monitoring devices. So by doing this analysis, we we're able to, like I said, pinpoint all the high stress zones. And then we developed a monitoring plan. Uh, and the monitoring plan included the use of strain gauges. So we placed strain gauges on the steel bottom flange uh, as well as top flange. We also uh, apply strain gauges uh, on the rebar, uh, the rebar uh, actually over the piers because primarily that's where tension is going to develop and we want to make sure that we minimize uh, cracking and as well as laser targets. And the laser targets were used uh, to monitor uh, the twist on the deck and I can show you some of the um, targets. So what you see here are just some construction photos. Uh, this is the steel girder being erected uh, on the temporary supports. And on the right side, uh, what you see here at the bottom flange, this is actually one of the strain gauges. Uh, and then we apply another strain gauge at the uh, top flange. Now, you don't need strain gauges everywhere. Uh, in this case, we apply strain gauges on the mid span of the bridge because they're uh, close to the high moment uh, zone areas as well as at the piers. Uh, again, uh, this shows one segment being uh, connected to the other over the temporary supports. Uh, you see the splices here. Uh, this is the bridge when it uh, was, you know, uh, fully built. Um, as you can see, the SPMTs, they came in between the supports uh, to pick up the structure. These are the transfer panels that, uh, uh, that were used uh, as part of this design. I did mention to you early in the presentation that we didn't include the barrier um, uh, to its full extent. So what we did, we only cast the outer shell being integral and then the rest of the barrier, uh, it was cast uh, later on, uh, primarily because we had a very large overhang and by including the full barrier, uh, we would not, uh, there would be some substantial cracking and, and uneven distribution of the, the weight of the deck over the, the flanges of the tub girder. Uh, and this is just an infomercial that was um, put together by the authority. But uh, the one that I like the most is that the, this bridge move was heavier than uh, 75 uh, humpback whales. Um, just a, 
I thought it was an interesting uh, stat. And then here, this is the move for bridge number two. And I'll try to show you a few details. Um, so this was last year, November 24, 25th. Um, and one thing that I liked too was the, the barrier being colorful. Um, it was very neat. Um, so here they're getting prepped uh, for the move. And we started this on a Friday night. Um, and with the objective of being done by Monday, uh, Monday morning. Um, you can actually see the laser targets at the top. So these are all the laser targets that are going to measure the twist. So now we're backing up of uh, the construction yard. Uh, all the traffic has been uh, diverted. Uh, as you can see, there are lights because this movie is being done at night. So we need this is the operator. Um, it's amazing. Um, you know, the knowledge of the operator to do move an entire bridge. Uh, while this bridge movement was occurring, we were actually uh, viewing it from the US uh, via, um, they use aquamonics. Aquamonics monitor all the strain gauges and the laser targets. And you can see the bridge being adjusted up and down here, uh, primarily because the supports are settling and then they have to adjust. And now we're trying to swing the bridge into place and pay attention on uh, the last scenes, but here are the laser targets. So these are all measuring the twist. So you have actualized a laser target on the opposite uh, pier uh, and they're crossing diagonally each other so they can measure uh, all the twists on the bridge. We found the laser targets actually to be more accurate than the strain gauges. The, the strain gauges are accurate, of course, uh, but the challenge is that with strain gauges, you have a, a lot of noise that it gets generated so your readings are not as smooth uh, with the laser target as actually you can see uh, the bridge moves the bridge moves uh, taking place um, fairly smooth um, so that was sorry so this was one of the uh, advantages and with that I uh, will end my presentation and see if you have any questions. Yeah, Marco, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I gathered all the questions. If you have any other questions, please send me, then I will show you. Uh, I will take the authority for the view. Yes, uh, Marco, you can keep going. So how is the deck plate element connected to the beam elements? Sh sharing the node or rigid link. Uh, if I recall correctly, we did use rigid links to connect uh, the, the deck to the, the beam. Under negative moment, the deck will be cracked. How do you consider this, this stiffness reduction? So in the US, uh, as well as the Australian code, uh, you have, uh, in the US, you can analyze the bridge as being, uh, without being cracked throughout the entire structure. That's the approach that we use. And then we also use the Australian code. The Australian code has two ways that you can go. You can perform the analysis being fully uncracked, but then if you do that, you have to do a adjustment uh, with a couple of the equations. But the other option that you have is to crack the deck over the piers uh, about 15% on each side of the center line of the pier. And that's established in the um, Australian code. Uh, we did analyze for both actually using the 15% and also doing for the fully uncracked. Um, have you considered four steel girded typical section versus two steel tub typical section? And why you selected two steel tubs for final? Uh, we didn't have a much of a choice on that. Uh, keep in mind that this is a design build uh, that is also dictated by urban planning and architects. So we had to go with the steel tubs, uh, only two, and also with the vertical webs. As you know, um, 
you could do incline webs. This was not an option as part of this project. And uh, so we had to go with vertical webs. And as a matter of fact, going with vertical webs in a curved profile is actually uh, easier to fabricate. So the goal, the overall goal of the contractor is, it's interesting because in the US we're primarily used to see savings on the fabrication and spend a little bit more steel. In Australia, is that quite the opposite? Uh, in Australia, the goal is actually to save on the steel, and uh, and they don't really care much on the fabrication, which I found interesting. And I thought it was just this project, but I'm currently working on a Westgate Tunnel project uh, in Melbourne. And again, the contractor is a different contractor, but uh, uh, again, uh, we're even having steel optimization workshops where we are trying to. Uh, minimize the weight of steel at the expense of fabrication, so they don't really care about the cost of fabrication. How did you model Himida Civil, the composite section at the bottom and top flange? Can you explain some details? Okay, so the the so we did use plate elements at at the top. So we turn on the deck. Um, at the point that it had obviously to become composite with the steel. And then within Midas, you can take your section resultant cuts. So you're basically combining your steel action with the plate elements. So it was not, you know, if you do just do a beam element or with the simple uh, standard sections that are given within Midas with the steel plus the slab at the top, um, it's fairly simple because you can just plot your your beam moment diagram, but when you mix beam elements with the um, plate elements, then you actually have to take resultant cuts um, and create some virtual sections. So that's how we did it. As far as the for composite section uh, on the bottom, uh, the, the, cro the cross sectional properties, we just transformed the concrete um, to an equivalent steel section. Okay, is there a companion paper on the steel box girder double composite design? Um, the topic is interesting beyond the Midas application. So I didn't mention at the beginning of the presentation, we did write a paper on this, um, but we didn't get you know in detail on, on the overall design. Um, if you are interested, I would highly recommend that you take a look at the University of South Florida study. I think they, they did a much better job than I could explain to you. Uh, as a matter of fact, they do present some of the calculations and how the approach is done for a, a double composite girder. Um, so please try to get a hold of that uh, that study. Uh, it's very insightful, as a matter of fact. Okay, what are the settlement differential settlement values? Which code? Well, there's not really a code for this, um, and I that's a very good question, right? Because how do we go about uh, determining what is an acceptable uh, settlement? Uh, limit. Okay, so if you make your settlement too small, then what's going to happen is that the contractor is going to have to stop frequently and have to adjust the SPMT supports, uh, and that's going to delay. Now, if you make your settlement too large, then you run the risk of cracking your deck and damaging your your steel elements. So, where is the limit, right? Um, we did find we at first we tried to limit uh, just to the modules of rupture of the concrete. Well, the limits that we got were fairly small with that. You're getting in the order of five to 15 millimeters, um, and that was not a, a, an option uh, because we would have to do frequent adjustments. Uh, so what we did is the following. At the moment that the bridge was picked up by the SPMT support, we set, uh, we recorded all the um, state of stress on the bridge. And from that point on, we said, okay, what are our peak points of stress? And we are going to allow a 100% stress increase on any of these high points of stress, and that's gonna be our displacement uh, limit. Um, we did that, and but obviously we did also check the uh, the stresses on the rebar over the over the piers as well as the strength of the box and the strength of the steel was never an issue. It was always always the deck, 
but we did check again all the stresses, uh, theoretical stresses on the rebar to ensure that even with that 100% increase, uh, there would be no adverse effects. To give an order of magnitude, uh, we had about 100 uh, of uh, vertical displacement at the abutments, um, and then approximately 20 to 25 millimeters of twist. Um, now, if you're planning to do any SPMT move, I, I gotta warn you. So what happens is because we need to give strain values, so we had to get the stresses from MIDAS and then transform into strain, and then we had to give strain values for the strain gauges uh, to during the monitoring process. Uh, what we found out is there is a large fluctuation just in temperature gradient alone, uh, and that has to be taken into account. Uh, we Initially, we did not take that into account, but what they do is they will install the monitoring system uh, uh, several days prior to the bridge move and will start monitoring just the, the overall behavior of the bridge. And you can see uh, the variation in strain just by going from day to night, and then you have to take that into account um, uh, on your um, move. Uh, the other thing that you also have to take into account is you give the limits to the contractor. Um, we did give the limits to Sarens, uh, and they did a calibration, which means they actually uh, settled the supports on purpose to do that calibration. So they did push the bridge up and down the abutments 100 plus millimeters or so, and then recorded all the strains because that's how we did all the calibration. So if you're gonna do an SPMT move and give deflection limits, uh, rest assured that they are gonna calibrate uh, for that. Okay, is it possible to get a link for the video we just saw? Absolutely, I'll have uh, Raphael, I send the, the links to Raphael and then he can uh, um, distribute the links. Can you go to the next page? Is there any more questions of Raphael? Okay. What types of, of joints were used on, on the bridge? Uh, that I don't quite recall because we were so immersed on the, uh, you know, the whole design process. So the substructure design was not done by our office. That was done by our friends in Adelaide, uh, Jacob's Adelaide, and they also designed uh, the, the joints as well. So I, I'm gonna owe you that response. What is the reason to use shell element for the deck instead of solid element? Uh, for the type of analysis that we are doing, we felt that the, the shell element would have done its, uh, its job uh, appropriately, um, primarily because you know using the solid element, we probably would have to go uh, we were we are not really familiar with the solid, but looking back, um, maybe that's something we sh should have investigated. But I feel fairly comfortable that the shell element that is provided within the program uh, can do its its conclusion is that all the stresses that we got from the program we transform into strains, and they were uh, and when they did the calibration. Uh, flexing the bridge, um, we were pretty close and we were in a reasonable range for the estimated uh, strains uh, that we came up with. What program do you use to create the animation of the move? Uh, that was done by the authority. Um, and that was not done by Jacobs. That was done by the South Dor Darlington uh, Upgrade Project. There is actually a website for the South Darlington Project. Um, and uh, I will have uh, I'll send that link to Raphael as well. Did you consider pre-compressing the concrete deck by casting the girder high at the interior supports, having the deck in compression during the SPMT move? Uh, no, we, we didn't. Uh, we just primarily follow, uh, you see, when it comes down to design builds, there's a lot of things that uh, you know the designer wants as a as a wish list, and we had our wish list. But uh, at the end of the day, the contractor is making the calls, and um, one of the things that we had on our wish list, that we tried to push it very hard, was not to use a fairly thin web, 
and the contractor no said no I, I want you to use the 16 millimeters so uh, no we didn't look at that uh, pre-compression of the concrete how are the dynamic impact effects however small during the move were considered in the SPMT analysis yes we did consider that uh, even though it's un it's unlikely um, you might have situations where you have uh, a SPMT wheel that is going to sink uh, on the dirt and which we actually had on the first bridge move so they had to back it up and put steel plates so that it could go over uh, we did apply a uh, impact factor of about 25% for the um, dynamic effects during the move. 